and open to John chapter 6. You people like each other, I can see that. That's good. That's very good. <laughs> John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, the title of our message this morning is Growing in Faith. Growing in faith, right out of John 6. Let's just pray, then receive from his word. Father, thank you so much for your word. We know that you send your heart, you send your desire to bless our lives, and you call us to walk in a place that's nearer to you and stronger in faith. So Lord, we pray this morning you would use the word by your Holy Spirit to transform us and increase us in you. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, John chapter 6, Jesus is headed north again back into the Sea of Galilee area. Now you have to understand that at this point in his ministry, his popularity is growing immensely. Great crowds are now beginning to follow him. And uh, you have to also understand, however, that not everyone is following him for the right reasons. See, many are, are amazed. They've, they've seen, they've heard, they were in Jerusalem uh, and they've seen and heard some of the wonderful things that he was doing as he was performing uh, healing on the sick. But they don't understand who he is, yet they are amazed. And they follow after him because they want to see what he will do, what amazing things. And of course, they want their sick to be healed. Now in verse 4, uh, John tells us that the Passover was at hand and uh, a great multitude is following him. Remember, Jesus was just in Jerusalem at the Passover and a vast multitude of Jews from the Galilee area were there. No doubt they also had seen and heard the great things that Jesus did in Jerusalem. And so they're following, of course, to see what he will do next, what he will do there. So what follows then is the feeding of the 5,000, very famous and in fact, this is the only miracle of Jesus that is in all four of the Gospels. Therefore, it's very significant, very important, that when we say 5,000, that actually is only counting the men. Uh, you add the women and children to that crowd, and it could well be 10, 12,000 or more. And so this is a really amazing miracle as Jesus, of course, is going to now feed this great crowd. What had happened for us is important because this is a story that applies to each of us personally. There's so much for us to understand out of this story. Jesus sees this crowd. He has compassion on the crowd. He's ministering to them. Uh, he's healing their sick. He's teaching them many things. He's ministering to them all day long. And when it comes to evening, the disciples come to Jesus. Now we get this from the other gospels because it's in all four gospels. So what had happened was, here's Jesus, he's ministering, you know, he's teaching all day long to the crowd, and then while he's doing this, the disciples are having a little community meeting. Apparently they decided that Jesus needed a little advice. And so they come to Jesus and they, they tell him, look, send the people away. Send them away that they may go find lodging, find something to eat, for we're in a desolate place. Now, Jesus then turned to them. And testing their faith. This is a very important aspect of the story. Testing their faith said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Then he specifically turns to Philip. And this is where we get it out of John 6. He said, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? Now, it tells us clearly that he said these things to test Philip. All right. Let's read this story. There's a lot for us. We're going to unpack it and look at it and apply it, beginning in verse 1. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, also known as the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude was following him because they were seeing the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Jesus went up onto the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Jesus, therefore, lifting up his eyes, seeing that a great multitude was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread that these may eat? And this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not enough. It's not sufficient for them, for everyone even to receive a little. Now remember a denarii is about a day wage. So this is about 200 days wage, he said, which would be a lot of money. Uh, even that amount of money would not be enough to feed this crowd for everyone to have a little. Then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here, a little boy here, who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these among so many people? 
Jesus then said, have the people sit down. Now we get from the other gospels that he had them sit in groups of 50 and 100. Now there was much grass in that place. In fact, when we go to Israel this fall, we're gonna go to this place. And you're gonna see that it's a perfect place, of course, to teach the crowd, minister to them, speak to all of them, and we're gonna walk on that grass, sit down, and have you know, a good Bible study. It's just a great time. So there's grace in, uh, grass in that place. So the men sat down in number of 5,000. Jesus, therefore, took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Now we get from the other gospels how he did this. He gave to the disciples, and the disciples then distributed to the groups of 50 and 100. So it tells us that he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to the disciples, now gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and they filled 12 baskets, not 10, not 15, 12. 12 baskets with the fragments from the barley, five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, when therefore the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is our truth, the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus therefore perceiving, get this now, that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. All right, very important, very important story, a lot for us to look at and apply to our lives. And I want to begin by looking at this aspect that Jesus said this to the disciples to test them. One of the things we really need to see in Scripture is the importance of this point, that faith must be tested. Faith must be tested. One of the principles from Scripture we have to understand is that in order for faith to increase, it must be tested. Let me give you a verse. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces something good. It produces endurance. Now, let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, this is what God uses in our lives to increase our faith, the testing of that faith. How does he do it? Through the trials and the difficulties of our lives. A lot of times we look at trials and difficulties, uh, I think, from the wrong perspective. We look at them as, uh, you know, oh no, this is terrible, and we get really upset, and oh no, no, and frustrated, and stressed, and oh, oh, this is terrible. Yet God is using it. If we would only understand, hey, God will use this in our lives for something good. God is testing our faith. What does it mean to test our faith? It means to give opportunity for it to be applied in our lives. Now, testing. Who likes tests? Not me. I don't like tests at all. In fact, I remember when I was at Oregon State, uh, I, I took these math tests, and I, I just did not do well. I just looked at them and stared at them and had all this anxiety going in me. In fact, for years after I left the university, I had nightmares that I'm sitting at this you know, desk and I'm staring at this test and I don't have the answers and I have all this anxiety. And, and this was, you know, for years I had this. And of course it probably has something to do with the fact that I didn't study for those tests. But I had a you know, problem. Now there are some interesting stories of people taking tests. For example, there was the police recruit who was taking an exam. And one of the questions on the exam was this. What would you do if you had to arrest your own mother? To which he answered on the exam, I would call for backup. That's what I would do. <laughs> or about the, uh, the two basketball players that uh, were about to go on academic probation if they didn't pass this test. So they had to go this test, and they, the coach, you know, pulled a few strings, made it a little easy for them, but still apparently they were struggling. So they got to the first uh, 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 question, and the, the first guy, Bubba, uh, turned to the other guy and said, hey man, help me out with this question. The question is, what did old McDonald have? You are so stupid. Everybody knows that old McDonald had a farm. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the help. Thanks for the help. 
Question number two, spell the word farm. Bro, help me out with this. What, how do you spell the word farm? And he said, you are so stupid. Everybody knows how you spell. It's E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> okay. I thought I put that in there. Anyway, the, the point is the testing of our faith is something important because it makes faith stronger. Here's the point. God wants us to trust him more. God wants to trust him more. It's not about passing or failing. It's about applying faith to the concerns of our life, to the needs, the difficulties, the trials that we go through. And what we need to understand as we look at this is when you look at the story, there's much for us to glean out of it. For example, do not despise the day of small beginnings. This is part of the story. This is a theme that comes through. God takes the small things, the insignificant, and it's because they are in his hand that they become significant. See, this is a theme that we have to understand. God takes the insignificant and makes it something significant because of his hand. Now, Philip answers first. His answer gives us the sense that perhaps he was the classic admin personality. You know, he's got it calculated out. He's looked at the size of the group. He's calculated how much bread, what that would cost. And he said, even if we had 200 denarii worth of bread, that would not be sufficient. So his answer is, we don't have enough. And even if we had a lot more money, we don't have enough. That's his answer. No faith in that at all. Now, Andrew spoke up next. There's a lad here, and he's got five barley loaves and two fish. Now, that actually would have been a pretty good answer if he would have stopped right there. But then he adds, but what are these for so many people? Then you have the boy. Now, it's safe to conclude that the boy came from poverty. He's insignificant. You say, well, how do you know he's from poverty? Because barley was the poorest quality bread that could be had. It was just poor quality. Barley, it was just rough, cold bread that was just poor quality. And you know, there's, as we know, there's different qualities of bread. And uh, you know, today, there's some really, you know, today the latest great thing is, you know, Dave's killer bread. It's like, wow, it's great bread. But when I was growing up, we had white wonder bread. Do you remember this stuff? <laughs> And, and I remember, because you could roll it up in a, like in a roll and squeeze it with your hand, and your fingerprint would be, your finger would, it would hold the shape of your hand like that. There's quality of bread. And barley is low. The boy is poor. In other words, he's insignificant. We have an insignificant boy with insignificant lunch. Five barley loaves. And let's not think of them as, you know, French baguettes. you like this. No, they're like little rolls. This is lunch. But he gives them to Andrew. Give this, give this to him, give this to him, give this to him. And you get a sense of faith here, the faith of a child. Give this to him. A little insignificant boy with an insignificant lunch. The point is, of course, what it becomes. When his mother packed that lunch that morning, she had no idea that that lunch would be used of the Lord in such a significant way. But this is important to apply because people often have a lack of faith when they look at their own lives and conclude that they're insignificant. There's nothing significant about them. There's nothing important. There's nothing significant. They have no background. They have no qualifications. And so they look at all of it and become very discouraged. And then they look at the huge problem that they face. It's a mountain of troubles. It's a mountain of, of difficulties. And then they look at themselves. They see the insignificance of their lives. And the mountain of troubles and the insignificance does not add up to them. And they become very, very discouraged. But this is where God wants us to increase our faith. The presence of the Lord makes all the difference in our lives. And faith is the key for us because that's what causes us to lift up our eyes in hope and begin to put our trust in our Lord. And in fact, there's a great story out of Israel in their history. When Israel was returning from Babylon, remember that Jerusalem was destroyed and Babylon took them into exile for 70 years. After Babylon actually fell, a new king came in place, Cyrus, 
who gave them, of course, instruction, go back, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. When they got back there, what did they find? The city was in ruins, literally a mountain of rubble. And they had few hands to fix it, few hands to repair it. And they became very discouraged, as we can see and imagine our own lives. A mountain, look at this huge, how in the, oh, and the discouragement. But then God sent a word. God sent encouragement to them. Remember now, the governor at the time, his name was Zerubbabel. So he sent a word through the prophet. And we get this out of Zechariah chapter 4. Look at verses 9 and 10 first. It says, look, now the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. And I'm telling you right now that the hands of Zerubbabel will finish it. Who will despise? Who has despised the day of small beginnings? Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Oh, we're just starting out so small. It's so insignificant. We have so little. So few people, so hand, few hands. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. And then he gives why. Zechariah 4, verses 6 to 7. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying this, it is not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. See, we, we have to understand this. Because we look at the mountain of the problem and then we look at ourselves. There's where the problem is. We look at ourselves in comparison to that problem. And indeed, we do not match up to the problem. But then when you see what God's answer is, it's not by might, it's not by your power, it's by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I love what he says next. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it, because it was God's grace that did it by his Holy Spirit. This is one of the hardest lessons for us to learn. But it is a lesson of faith, and it's to be applied to the stuff of our lives because we face so many troubles and difficulties, sometimes mountainous ones. But then we see another lesson that we have to learn that's very important for us to get out of the story, and this is this. Use what he's given you. Use what he's given you, of course, with the right heart. And here's the point. One of the ways that people despise the day of small beginnings is because they get frustrated because what they have is not enough for them. Follow with me this. What they have is not enough for them. That's too small for them. I want more than that. That's not enough for me. They're not content, in other words. They won't give thanks for what they have. And this is a very important point, although that's the very first thing that Jesus did. Notice, an insignificant boy gives an insignificant lunch to Andrew. He hands it to Jesus. What's the first thing he does? He lifts it up, and he gives thanks to God for it. A heart that is thankful is a very important key of our walk of faith with the Lord. So he gives thanks. Many people are not content with what they have. And they don't give thanks to God for it. I'm telling you what, if we would be thankful, it would change our perspective completely. He gives thanks, then he broke it in his hand, and he made it sufficient for everyone's needs. Notice something. When you imagine this miracle, sometimes I think people imagine that he made a mountain of barley loaves. And then said to the disciples, you know, have at it, go bring it up. This is not what happened. But instead, he took the lunch and he gave to the disciples and distributed it. He gave some more and he gave some more and he gave some more. In other words, he took what he had and he used it and he became more. And he just kept giving it and more was provided as it was being given. No more, no less. It's important for us to understand because many people don't want God to work that way. They want the whole thing right now, immediately. They want the top position. They want the, they want the great success. They want to win the lottery. They, they, they want to immediately master the thing. They don't want to do the homework. They don't want to carry the water. It's interesting. Notice that the disciples had to carry the bread and the fish. Now, this is on a hill. You're, when you go there, you're going to know what I'm saying. 
the disciples had to carry up and down, up and down, up and down. Interesting that the disciples didn't say to the Lord, you know what, you didn't do this miracle very well, Lord. You know, why didn't you just make the baskets of barley loaves and fish appear in the middle of those groups and they could have just passed it around amongst themselves. We wouldn't have to walk up and down this hill. Up and down, up and down, up and down. This is an important thing. Many people don't want to carry the baskets. Why do I have to carry the basket? I don't want to carry the baskets. I don't, I don't carry, it's not my job description. I don't carry baskets. They don't want to do the homework. They don't want to do the dishes. They don't want to carry out the garbage. They don't want to carry the bread. They don't want to carry the water. To which I would say, in that case, you limit what God will do. You are limiting what God will do in your life when you, when you say, I don't do that. I won't do that. It's too insignificant for me. I don't do things like this. Interestingly, there's a story out of the scriptures that's similar. There was a man, he was actually a, a commander in the army of Aram, not in Israel, but in Aram. Great warrior, the scripture tells us, his name was Naaman. The problem was he had leprosy. Now, he had a little Jewish girl as a maid in the house, and the Jewish girl said to the captain, did you know that there is a prophet in Israel? And that prophet in Israel is able to heal you of your leprosy. So Naaman gets encouraged by this. He gets horses and chariots and a big entourage. And he goes to, uh, to Elisha and, uh, you know, offers him great money. He said, keep your money. And uh, doesn't even come out to him. Go dip in the, the Jordan River seven times. He is infuriated at this idea. Go dip in the Jordan River. That's a dirty. Why would I do that? Just dip, just lower myself in the, oh, he gets furious. There are better rivers in Aram than the Jordan. And he turns around to leave, and his, his servant said to him, sir, if he would have asked you to, to have done something difficult, you would have done it. Will you not do a small thing? Will you not do the simple thing? So he calmed down, and he said, you're right. So he went down to the Jordan, and he just did what the prophet said. He dipped down into the water seven times. Of course, we know the story. Uh, when he came up out of the water, his skin was healed. And the scripture says, like the, the, like the skin of a, of a child. What a beautiful picture for us. But here's the point. He had to be willing to do the simple little thing. I taught a class a number of years ago. And the class was about what Christians believe, like basic, you know, basic theology class. And on the very first class, uh, I always asked everyone to memorize all the books of the Bible in order. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all the books of the Bible. And, and I said, you know what, it's not as hard as you think. I got some really clever little things, and we're going to do it together right now. 30 minutes, we're going to have all of you with the books of the Bible memorized. Because it's important because, you know, we're going we're gonna to be turning pages and it's important that you be able to stay up with us, okay? So here we go. We're going to give you the tricks. You guys are going to do it. 30 minutes, you're going to get it. So sure enough, you know, I did this thing. 30 minutes later, I had somebody stand up and they gave all the books in the Bible in order. I noticed that there was this gal who was having nothing to do with it. So sometime later, we were talking and... Uh, I said, what do, you, what do you think of the uh, memorizing the books of the Bible? She says, no, I don't do that. Really? Well, why is that? No, I don't memorize things. I said, really? Why is that? Because I don't have a good memory. I can't memorize things. I said, really? I said, who gave you that mind of yours? Didn't God give that to you? God gives you that which is good. Don't insult the Lord who gave you something very fine. Use it. I said, use it and he will give you more. Use what you have and he will give you more. Use what you have and he will give you more. Use what you have and he will give you more. This is a very important point for us. Use what you have and he will give you more. Philippians 2, verse 13, it says, look, it is God who is at work in you. Who is at work in you? God. 
If God is at work in you, do not discount it. Do not insult the Lord. God is at work in you. Use it, and he'll give you more. And he'll, he will strengthen you and add more to it. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. How about Luke 6, 38? Give, and it will be given to you. Use what you have, and more will be given. Given, it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Use what you have, and more will be given. It's a very important point. Now, going back to John chapter 6, we also have to see this, that tested faith will grow. Tested faith grows. Remember the verse in James 1, that the testing of your faith produces endurance? The point is, Faith that is tested is faith that will grow. Jesus in John 6 is training the disciples. Now, how does Jesus train the disciples? He's strengthening their faith. How does he do this? It's important to see. He's giving him principles. Throughout the teaching of the Lord, you see these principles that he gives them. And then, with their eyes, they see the power of God moving, and then he gives them opportunity to apply this to their lives and to their ministry. It's important to see, first of all, principles that he gives them are to be applied. See, this is important for us. God gives us principles, truth, wisdom in his word, and he wants us to be applying them to our lives. Not just learning them, not just hearing them, living them, applying them. Principles are to be applied. God gives us the word of truth to do it. When the multitude had been satisfied, he said to the disciples, now gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost, and exactly 12 baskets were left over. Exactly 12. Are there lessons here? Is there a principle to be applied? Absolutely. See, the whole story is about the sufficiency of what God can do. Little is much when God is in it. It's about the sufficiency, right, of what happens when God does it. I love Psalm 127, verse 2. We mentioned that last week. I want to quote it again. It is vain for you to rise up early. Get this. It's vain. Which, what does that word vain mean? It's empty. There's nothing in it. It's vain to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. Isn't that a great phrase? Especially in the context of eating bread in John 6. To eat the bread of painful labors, for it is he who gives to his beloved even while he sleeps. All right? Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. There are principles here, principles to be applied. The multitude was completely filled, in other words, completely satisfied. There's a principle right there. There are so many places in God's word that speaks about uh, God, the Lord, being uh, the bread of life. The bread of life. Manna for the soul. Then that just sounds so satisfying. This is a very important point for all, us to receive. The satisfying of the empty soul is what God does in our lives. And then God gives the opportunity to apply that in our lives. Here's another example. At one point, Jesus was with the disciples. They were actually in a boat. They were crossing over the sea. And Jesus said to them, beware, beware. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. And then they said amongst themselves, now he said that because we forgot to bring bread. Jesus responded, you men of little faith, why are you discussing amongst yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand? Do you not remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you picked up? In other words, were you listening and hearing and understanding what was happening. There's a principle here to be applied. There was another occasion. Jesus had sent the disciples out to spread the gospel to towns and villages, but he sent them out without money bag or without uh, uh, sandals or belt, money belt in other words. Now, this is important. In fact, he brought it up to them later. 
He gave them an opportunity to go out and apply faith in their lives. That's how it grows. Luke 22, verses 35 to 36, he said to them, now when I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, now did you? And they said, no, nothing. In other words, remember that. Don't forget this. This is a very important principle. Remember, when I sent you out without money bag, belt and sandals, you didn't lack anything, now did you? No, we didn't. Remember that. Don't forget that. Live that. Apply that. See, this is important to understand. This is how faith is tested. It is applied to life. This is a very important thing. God gives us the answer first. Here's my point. God gives us the principles. God gives us the wisdom. God gives us the truth first. And then he says, now apply that. Now live that. It's very similar to how uh, we would learn math. How do, how do we learn math? You know, now that I have... Uh, some grandkids, I, I love getting involved with their homework again. You know, when we, when we raised our kids, we raised five, I, I loved helping them with their homework. I think I enjoyed their homework more than they enjoyed their homework. I got it. I just love doing it. Come on, get, get out your mouth. Come on, let's do this, you know. And I was like homework king. And uh, so they're all grown and gone. I'm missing this, you know. So now, uh, you know, our grandkids are coming along and they're learning, you know, their basic addition tables and things like, okay, come on, let's do this thing, you know. How do you learn math? The answer is this. You give them the answer first. That's how you learn math. For example, you say, like, let me help you to understand how to add things together. Two plus two is four. Look, I'll prove it to you. Here's two fingers and here's two more. See, what is that? See, that's four. See, two plus two is four. Now, remember that. Two plus two is four. Two plus two, see? Two plus two is four. Now you tell me, how much is two plus two? They'll say, thank you. <laughs> but my point is, I gave the answer first. You see the point? I gave the answer first. And then I asked them, now you tell me what the answer is. By the way, have you noticed how, how math has changed? Math is a great application, by the way. Have you noticed how math has changed over the years? If you've been around a while, you might know how, how math has changed. In the 60s, for example, math was straightforward. Let me give you a straightforward question from a math test from the 60s. It went like this. A logger cuts and sells a truckload of lumber for $100. His cost of production is four-fifths of that is amount. What is his profit? All right, that's a straightforward math question from the 60s. Then, however, came the 70s and new math. Oh, new math was absolutely something. It went like this. A logger exchanges a set L of lumber for a set M of money. Now, the cardinality of set M is 100. The set C of production cost contains 20 fewer points. What is the cardinality of set P for profits? Yeah, that's what I felt too, right there. <laughs> then we had the 80s dumbed-down version. A logger cuts and sells a truck a little load of lumber for $100. His cost is 80, his profit is 20. Find and circle the number 20. Okay, that, <laughs> that was the dumbed-down version right there. And then, then we had the 90s enlightened version. A logger cuts down a beautiful stand of 100 trees in order to make $20 profit. Write an essay explaining how the forest animals felt about their... <laughs> it's changed, you know, over the years. Interestingly, it actually has changed, and one of the things that it's changed is this. Today, the emphasis is on story problems. You know why that is? Because they've discovered that you learn more when you apply it. You learn more when you apply it to life. You learn more when you apply it to life. Doesn't that sound just like what the Lord is doing? And that is the testing of faith. When you apply faith is when you learn it. See, this is important. How do you, how do you respond to the things of life? Troubles, difficulties. Many people come up with their own ideas. I know what I'll do. I've got my own plan. Here's the thing we have to understand. God's plan is always better. God's plan 
is always better. Notice something here. When the people, this is in verses 14 and 15, when the people saw the sign which Jesus had performed, they decided on a plan. They were going to take him by force to make him king. They wanted a king, they had an agenda, and they were going to use Jesus to accomplish what their plan was. They wanted to use Jesus for their purpose. They didn't want Jesus to use them for his purpose or for his glory. This is important because how we respond to the things of life is key for us. If we come up with a plan, and if that plan includes God, it often comes in the form of using God to accomplish what we want, our purpose. But God's plan is always better. God's plan is to allow situations where we need to respond spiritually. God's plan includes allowing situations where we have to apply living faith. Take the principles of his word. They are to be applied. They are to be lived. And there are situations, there are things that happen in our lives. There are sometimes mountains of troubles that need us to then take the principles of God's word and apply them to those situations and the difficulties. But they must include trusting God in a living faith. They are to be applied. How do you respond to financial challenges? How do you respond to a marriage that's broken? Well, I got my plan. I know what I'm, I'm gonna get really angry. Your plan's not good. God's got a better plan than that. God's got a plan that includes blessing your spouse and blessing you in response to it. What are you gonna do when your children start to take on the attitude of the world? Well, I'm gonna come up with a plan. God's got a plan. God's got a way, apply it. What are you gonna do when the difficulties and troubles of life and work and, and family and all of these are opportunities to live faith eight? out. Many people come up with their own plan, but I can absolutely assure you that God's plan is always better. But the question is very straightforward. Will you trust him? Will you trust him? Will you apply? Will you live what he's asking us to live? Psalm 138 verses 7 to 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. This is a great verse. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. You will revive me, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Now get this verse, because this is one of those great verses that helps us to apply God's word in our lives. Though I walk in the midst of troubles. Man, we are walking in the midst of troubles right now. The world of troubles. And you have your own world of troubles. What does he say next? You will revive me. Though I walk in the midst of troubles, you will revive me. Here's God's plan. God's plan begins with reviving your soul. God says, look, I need you to respond to, you, to this spiritually. I need you to respond to this with faith. Now, in order for you to do that, you've got to be revived in soul. You can't respond spiritually when your soul is empty, when your soul is sick. I want to revive you. God's got a better plan. Will you go along with God's plan? I don't need, I don't need to be revived. You're missing out then. You are missing out. If your soul is empty, you're empty. If your soul is sick, you're sick. God's plan includes the healing of the soul, the reviving of the soul. Though I walk in the midst of troubles, he will revive me. And then it says, and your right hand will save. Trusting that God will move. Maybe we need to pray more. Maybe we need to ask God to be involved in our lives by asking him in prayer. You have not because you ask not, the scripture says in James. We need to pray, God. Help me, stand with me, walk with me through the midst of it. His promise is sure 
In fact, it says, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. That is faith right there, lived out in life. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. And then it's based on what? Your loving kindness, O Lord. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. God's plan is way better. Will you trust him? There's the question. Will you trust him? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Because your word so encourages us, it so draws us into a relationship of faith, trusting you for the everyday troubles. Church, as we're praying this morning, Do you face troubles? Are you walking in the midst of troubles even now? The question is, will you trust God in it? Will you believe God for it? His plan is better. He's got a way better plan. And it begins with reviving your soul. This morning, if you would respond to the Lord. If you would say to God, God, I wanna honor you with my life. I want to trust you in the midst of my troubles. I place my faith in you now. I trust you, God. Revive my soul. Accomplish what concerns me. I'm placing my faith, I'm placing my trust. Oh God, would you help me now? Just raise your hand. Just say that to the Lord. Say, so, Lord, there's my, there's my prayer. Here's where I am. Lord, I need you to move. I'm asking that you would do this. Lord, I trust you. Father, just move by your spirit. We pray that you would minister your life because you have indeed demonstrated that your loving kindness is everlasting. So, Lord, we honor you now as we trust you. Our faith is to be lived. So, Lord, we come to you with it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise?